Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Brown Bag. Excuse me, the V Brown Bag. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking with a wonderful person that that hails from Texas. Uh, he works for Worldwide Technology. His name is Dan Pallone, and tonight he's going to be talking about EKS or EKS or how I'm not sure how you want to pronounce that. I'll, uh, well, we're going to ask Corey Quinn about that. So tonight we are going to be talking about Kubernetes in Amazon, why you should use EKS, different pronunciations for the words and all kinds of different things to get answered. But first, a couple of show notes. Get in on the conversation. If you at V Brown Bag or hashtag V Brown Bag on Twitter, I will be paying attention. If you've got some questions that you want to ask of Dan, feel free to fire them off to me. If you are in our live studio audience this evening, then you have the Q&A panel in front of you and he, I will be able to take your questions and uh, give them to Dan as well. So once again, this evening, our guest is Dan Pallone. You can find him on Twitter at Dan Pallone. Super easy, D-A-N-P-A-L-L-O-N-E. How did you get that? That's uh, that was were you like one of the first people on Twitter, and you grabbed that real fast. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Same with Hotmail too. Man, awesome. And uh, I, of course, am your host, uh, Chris Williams. And you can yell at me at Mistwire on Twitter if you have uh, any complaints about the episode, or not, or if you get, if you liked it, then uh, by all means, let us know. Mr. Pallone, are you ready to take the power? Absolutely. All right, I'm going to stop share, and it is all yours. Excellent. I'm trying to figure this out here. Did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? Am I sharing? Can you there see you my share? I can see your share. You, have, you, are, you are lit. There we go. So hello, everybody. My name is Dan Pallone. And if you don't know me, you should. Um, EKS is a, a service offered by Amazon. Amazon is a the leader in cloud services. They are offering over 160 cloud services to enterprises, to developers, to smalls, to anybody who wants to leverage them for just about any purpose that's out there. From creating your own farm for Bitcoin mining, for uh, machine learning, for uh, figuring out where the best place is to drill for oil, to understanding your accounting, to just about anything on the planet you could imagine that you could do using an IT infrastructure to build it. So the, the real question I always start out with is, is what are people's understanding of, of Kubernetes? What are people's uh, expectations with Kubernetes? Kubernetes is that one thing that's supposed to answer all the questions. It, it, it auto scales up, it auto scales left, it auto scales right. It, I mean, it gets larger, it gets wider, it, it spans the whole globe. It, it can do, it can hybridize, it can do all these other things. But what's so special about Amazon having their own EKS offering? Let's go ahead and start. So today with my agenda, I'm going to go over the language of Kubernetes and make sure we normalize that. Then I'm also going to talk about what, it, uh, why you would choose EKS over another Kubernetes offering, and um, what it what it means to use the Amazon version of Kubernetes. Um, why why should I even think about uh, Kubernetes uh, or even EKS as a solution for my business, my enterprise? Uh, my development, or even my small. I, I have a small business, and we do support an application, but why would I go to EKS when people seem relatively happy with what I'm offering? And, and what does it take to move? What does it take to get there? I mean, am I, am I going to have to get an angel investor if I'm a small? Am I going to have to completely change my application and, and spend three years developing? or Or do I have to go to the enterprise and only the enterprise kind of money where they're the, you know, the, one of the top companies in the world focused on uh, the cloud and containerization and, and migrations. Do I have to be that guy? We're going to answer those questions today. So let's talk about language. Right now there are a lot of words being used uh, to describe what's a part of the integral Kubernetes infrastructure. So I'm an infrastructure guy. I mean, I'm an infrastructure guy from the very beginning of infrastructure. Like I was setting up uh, US robotics baud modems in the back of Linux boxes to use for um, 
uh, servers all over the country for semi-truck trailer manufacturing companies so that they can use their WISE terminals, W-Y-S-E, WISE terminals, to go ahead and log in and send their uh, UDP packets over these BOD modems. It's a non-transportable protocol over BOD modems to to update their trailer inventory and massive inventory. So that's that's infrastructure. It's infrastructure at its its most infinitesimal or most uh, uh, immature level, but it's infrastructure. And when you, when you think infrastructure, you think, how do I operate my business? How do I operate as a business owner or an enterprise? How do things come in and how do they go out? Well, they're always going to come in at you at the same rate. We should hope so. You know, you get 500 customers. They're always going to order, you know, one cheeseburger a day. That's that's a win. Every day you're going to sell those 500 cheeseburgers and you're going to be expected to do that. There's never going to be change if, if you're only ever going to anticipate 500 cheeseburgers. But if you've got infrastructure changes that have to happen quickly and you've got, you know, 100,000 or even 5 billion You've got to change your infrastructure at a moment's notice to serve your customers. So what we talk about when we're talking about infrastructure, it's always the same. It's always compute, right? You're always going to start out with a computer. Let's go back to when you were in high school and you had your first PC or, or middle school and you had your first PC and you had your first computer. You were able to do you know, maybe 20% utilization of that computer unless you're a gamer and you're blowing it up, right? But that's it. That's all that compute can do for you. But if you had five computers, could you play five games at the same time? Or could you play, you know, do as much five times the amount of homework or five times the amount of PowerPoint presentations or five times the amount of mixtapes? You could. If you were able to, you know, be that skill, that's pretty incredible skills, but um, you could. And let's take that compute and put it together in, and all of that compute is I.O. And that compute becomes an operating system with services stacked on top of it. Those containers are now being deliverable. Those containers coming from either VMware or coming from either um, any, any other type of container, just a rack and stack, those I.O.s are all put together. And those containers are now being put on top of those machines across the machines instead of at one computer. So now you've got cheeseburgers being served in Los Angeles, cheeseburgers being served in Chicago, and they're using containers to do it. And that container will move and expedite the building of those cheeseburgers at need by that location. So when I say containers, I'm saying that one build, that one particular service, that one particular workload, that container is an operating system and a few services that give you the information or consumes the information you're sending to them. Then we move into a node. A node is the point at which the compute exists. You need nodes to build a larger infrastructure. The more nodes, the larger infrastructure. So when people say, hey, we're at capacity with memory, you just add another node, more infrastructure. And if you think about it, you're just adding another server onto the rack. You're just adding another layer of compute. When we go into the Amazon instance of what a node is, it's another EC2 instance or ECS. It can be a container that stretches. It can be a EC2 instance that comes up and goes down based on scaling. Or it could be like Fargate and, and be serverless and just serve out the solution. That node in, in EKS, that node decides how your workload is done and how your uh, processing flows. Then we have microservices. Now microservices and services, they play together quite a bit. But this is the best way I can say for an analogy here. Everybody's gonna have a service, but a microservice doesn't need a person behind it. A microservice is an automatic service that's going to always give you one plus one equals two. It's a calculator. You're always gonna get that result. You're not gonna to have to go to a person, ask a couple of questions, they open up a ticket, they go through the service desk, service desk escalates, then you get a response. It's not a huge 
amount of work to get that one response. A microservice will give it to you quickly and it'll be compiled as a simple solution, ergo micro. But a service, that's where you've got an entire company servicing you or an entire solution servicing you. And finally, we have workloads. It's probably my favorite word when it comes to the cloud and, and compute and EKS and Kubernetes and all the like. P people mix the word workloads up quite a lot. Workloads um, is literally the entire stack from your DNS entry to where my website exists to the actual website stack to everything about the application that you're serving your customers, be it um, online uh, uh, off-track betting or, or some type of uh, fantasy football betting or something like that, a service, or even going to Amazon and searching for your favorite bottle of scotch. And the final nice. part is the data, <laughs> I played it in, right? Yeah, the final, I like that. The final part is that database layer. And that entire stack is your workload. Now, a workload doesn't necessarily fit in EKS or Kubernetes or ECS. Um, the reason I refer to ECS, it's still a container strategy. And what we're talking about today is container strategies. But EKS allows for services that Amazon doesn't have. It's hard to imagine that Amazon doesn't have the service you're looking for. I mean, if you're looking for Kibana and you're like, I don't know what is Kibana inside of Amazon, just ask because you can use, you know, uh, you, you can use some of the Kinesis services and, and coupled with Firehose and you have the same Kibana service. Or, or if I'm looking for something for metrics like Prometheus or uh, displaying a graph like that, there are services that do that in a Amazon, but there are services that exist outside of Amazon that you might want to be leveraging. Those workloads that, that leverage those services today um, fit hand and foot directly with EKS. It's designed for that. You want to have a service that isn't a part of Amazon or another another cloud provider, you know, Google or Azure, to give you those extra features. And that's why people choose Kubernetes. It's not that it's um, highly managed. It's not that it's uh, highly scalable. It's not that it's open sourced and it's got hundreds of thousands of people testing and building on it. It's that there are services and there are processes that you want to happen that isn't a canned service. And EKS definitely helps you build that. And you'll see that more evident in your enterprise when you start tearing down those monolithic apps and saying, how the heck am I gonna get this feature? I don't think anybody in the world's ever built it except in this giant EXE that Oracle spits out. We're just gonna have to build it ourselves from scratch and, and test it in something. What can we do that in? EKS is the way to do that. EKS is the way to break those pieces into smaller parts and start pulling it away from that monolithic application and stacking it and starting it and building it and providing it to your customer faster and smarter in a solution that Amazon can provide. So why EKS? What are these different features? Um, but before we... Uh, but before we go on, a, a quick question from the audience. Please. Um, is is the is the, a node the same as a container? Can a container have multiple nodes? What's the distinction between that? Um, nodes focus more on the compute. Container focuses more on what you're delivering. So if you want to have a instance or a container that has Java specifically, okay and you want to stand up a service that has Java underneath it, you're talking container. But if you want to have IO, a certain amount of storage, a certain amount of CPU, a certain amount of memory, or even a very specific processor, like a graphic processor or an ARM processor, we're talking node. Gotcha. You see the delineation okay. between the two? Um, yes, thank you. Yes, he says, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So, 
why EKS? Why, why, why not some other solution? Why, why don't I just install Minikube on my desktop and start running Kubernetes right now? Please do. I, I want you to get familiar with it and excited with it, but you're going to hit limits. You're going to hit walls and you're going to be in this configuration nightmare where you're spending hours and hours maintaining whatever code or whatever process you have to deliver to whoever you're delivering it to. And you're going to be frustrated with matching up versions and Helm chart versions and and and, and downloads and oh my gosh, uh, Kubernetes just came out with a major upgrade or there's a major patch in Kubernetes for a vulnerability in in, in this or that. Well, that's that's one of the best reasons to choose a container strategy that is uh, EKS because EKS allows you to have the management plane. Uh, managed by Amazon and not by you. That's one of the biggest overheads of an open source software. Every company I've ever worked, every enterprise I've ever worked for or, or consulted for, their first questions are, oh, it's open source? Well, we have to hire an entire army to make that BIF, that big improvement for free, B-I-F-F. I want a biff out of this. Well, you have to hire an army to support the open source. And that army is only operational guys, and they're just following SOPs and, and trying to maintain. So what happens if you don't have that budget for that army of guys to handle and manage and write and maintain those SOPs, let alone the infrastructure for that? Well, you fall behind. And migrating between version 1.16 to 1.17 to 1.18 to 1.19, that's not bad. But if you're 1.11 going to 1.19, we've got some problems. But there's a lot of changes there. And, and, and if, if, if I can be frank, I can say that uh, Terraform, you know, moving from one version of Terraform to another ter version of Terraform, we've all seen it, it, it can be a nightmare because you're, you're refactoring, you're almost completely rewriting everything you did in the past just to go up a version in Terraform. Well, Kubernetes, if you miss, you know, four, five, six version changes and your team's like, oh, we, we, we do updates once a year. Well, Kubernetes does three to four month deliveries of new versions. So if you're not ticking every three to four months, your operations team, you have to uh, do a huge migration where it's a huge lift, lift and shift every year. But yeah, that's that's definitely making sure you have your job for the next year, but uh, that's not the way to do it. You want your guys who are operational, Kubernetes savvy, to not be focused on the operations. You want them to start looking at the new containerization strategies, the new technology, and to get them off of that daily grind. <clears throat> So the networking and security that AWS and offers, the way they they wrote their own tool, and they bought out a company that had written a tool, and then they augmented a tool called EKS CTL, which I'll demo today, and and the the ease of using that and deploying your own cluster, it's a lot better than some of the tools that have been out there. You can still use kubectl as well if you're familiar. Uh, their management of nodes and workers, the control plane, um, managing the cluster updates, uh, working with other uh, open source tools. So if you go to the marketplace, you'll find a lot of tools you can play with there. And I, I've heard a couple of pretty good arguments about um, EKS and specifically around uh, tools like Rancher. Rancher can deploy <clears throat> EKS anywhere you want. Uh, uh, Kubernetes anywhere you want, like EKS. They can deploy it and they can get things up and running. But why did you choose EKS and Rancher? Well, Rancher's got this one feature where you can click a button and deploy Istio. That's the argument I always hear. Istio, I want Istio on this, on a EKS, because Google's got it with a one-click deploy. Why doesn't uh, Amazon have it? Why don't they have it yet? Well, they do. They have a solution. It's in the marketplace. Um, it's not a one-click deploy, because if you understood what what sidecarring is, with understanding with with the uh, the service mesh and and how those those deployments go, Amazon took the approach. You better know what you're doing before you click that button, because you could really damage your cluster by clicking that one click button. And Google took a little bit different approach. Let's click the button, and we'll 
offer you service uh, pro fees to go ahead and get you fixed and up and running because you really didn't understand what that one button meant. That's that's definitely where a developer space is important. But uh, those tools are available and those tools, those open source tools are supported by EKS and Amazon. So uh, who should do this? Who, who should be doing this? Um, <clears throat> that's a tough one. Uh, an enterprise is gonna take a look at it and they're gonna do this thing where they're gonna say, hey, what are my top service tickets for the company? I'm gonna do a triage of all of my service tickets, find the top 10 items. And I, if I can align those top 10 service tickets for my customer directly to an application issue, I wanna see if containerizing it or having a container strategy or getting in the cloud more or less off of my data center is a win. That's the first approach I've heard. Second approach. <clears throat> Our data center is way too expensive. Let's get off of our data center. Let's start migrating in everything, everything into the cloud. And we're gonna do it in six months because this company, XYZ company, they're very similar to us, they did it. And then the final approach. Uh, the new services that we're asking for are only available in the cloud. Those are the enterprise uh, statements that I've heard predominantly. The service is already available in the cloud. Why would I put it on my data center? The, my data center is too expensive. I need to start vaulting and saving money because the company needs to tighten its belt. And um, we're, we're looking to containerize. We're looking to get these strategies and moving forward um, one piece at a time. Next is uh, developers. <clears throat> Every developer I've ever worked with they have a laptop with five or six different logins to their own desktop, and they have their own Kubernetes environment running with uh, all kinds of tools that I'm not familiar with. And, and those tools um, almost inevitably are a version of Kubernetes. Now, a developer doesn't want to spend time doing operations and, and managing the back end and, and, and working with the worker nodes and doing upgrades and migrations and ensuring that it's secure enough that when he goes to the customer and he delivers the, the manifest files, he's like, okay, here it is. I did it on, on EKS. This is, this is secure. This is industry standard stuff. And, and this is why I'm doing it. I've seen a lot of people do it that way, and it's almost always a developer is number two, and they're they're choosing it because it's it's what everybody else is using it, and it's industry standard, and it's tried and true. Three. Developers and rapid prototyping. So, developers are Java coders sitting back writing big giant applications and then wrapping it in a manifest file and getting it in the cloud. A rapid prototyper is like, hey, I heard about this new tool. It's called Glue 14. I'm going to go ahead and download the, the GitHub repo and take a look. Oh, I have to put it in the cloud. And oh, it works better on Kubernetes. Um, if I had an EKS instance, I could just pop it up there and, and start testing it. Rapid prototyping. So a lot of R&D and, and larger companies have rapid prototyping needs. And EKS is amazing for that. It's got this tear up and tear down, build up and, and build out. It only builds, bills you on the instance as it's running. It's not gonna bill you just because it's sitting idle and there's no instances up and running. Just because you have code sitting there and it's not up and running or doing anything, doesn't mean you're gonna be billed for it. If it's a pod, if it's an instance scaling up and down, you're gonna be billed for it. But if it's been shut down because you were just testing it for 10 minutes and then you shut it down, you're gonna be billed for 10 minutes, but you're not gonna be continuously billed because you had to stand up a huge infrastructure for an enterprise with 13 database backends, uh, a direct connect back to the enterprise database at the company or a direct connect to a remote branch but rapid prototyping allows you to quickly pull down those GitHub YAMLs and, and those manifest files, build it up quick to do a POC, a proof of concept and say, hey, look at this, look at this, look what I can do, look what I can do. And uh, moreover, that turns into 
uh, you get a new new title on your at your job or you get a pay increase saying, hey, John's got an idea. He wants to use Istio. He wants to use service match. He's got sidecars over here. Have you heard of this thing? And folks, rapid prototyping is the, the third one. And the last one is, I think anyone who has time to learn about containerization strategies, whether the rapid prototyping, they're in an enterprise, they're a small, they're a medium business, they have just a website selling kittens, you're going to want to know if you can save money on your website because the your options for selling things are very burgers, <laughs> kittens, um, scotch. We're, we're, we've got, we've run the gamut tonight. Right. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> you're, you're going to want to know if, if, uh, if you move it into Kubernetes, you move that website, you move your app, you move your process in, into Kubernetes, if you're going to save money. If, if you're gonna turn that, that return on investment into not only a return on investment, but an investment that builds a big, better business, that builds a better widget, that builds faster cats or whatever it is, or better scotch, let's go with that. But yeah, I think anyone who has time should spend a little bit of time looking at Kubernetes EKS in the AWS uh, services and understand what it is and start deploying. I mean, I did and it's furthered my career. And so have a lot of other people that I've taught and it's furthered theirs. What does it take to get to EKS? What, what, are, what are the options? Well, there's three big options, okay? Now we're talking business, we're not talking rapid prototyping, we're not talking uh, uh, developers. Developers are just gonna spin it up, play with it, shut it down. Rapid prototypers, same thing. Spin it up, play with it, shut it down. And e even the, uh, the the average Joe at home is like, hey, I heard about this new technology and all I have to do is sign in with this account and I get a $150 voucher to go ahead and use AWS. And so it's $150 worth of compute I can use to figure out the lottery numbers for tomorrow. Let's try that with e EKS. So they go out and do that. But how do I migrate my workload into the cloud, into EKS, or into Kubernetes? Well, there's three ways. When I say foundational, I mean, you have an idea, you started working on the idea, maybe you have a buddy who's a developer and he's writing out some code, or from a business perspective, uh, you're building out a new version of your widget, your new version of whatever you're selling or building, and you're like, we're gonna go with a cloud first strategy. We're gonna be containerizing everything, container strategy. And instead of just containerizing it, we're gonna make sure it's HA, highly available. DR, it can survive disaster. <coughs> it is horizontally, meaning it can get bigger or smaller. Vertically, it can get wider and cover more uh, uh, requests per second of my application. And in doing that, you're going to be doing the foundational. You're going to clear the playing field. You're going to open up a dev account, specifically a dev account, and you're going to have people there or you, you're going to be there building it out to understand it, get it to work the way you want to, and there's no technical debt moving into this. You're moving into it with clear mind of what you're going to build. So you know what your end result is. That's foundational. Lift and shift. Uh, somebody uh, sold you a bottle of scotch and it's not scotch, it's vodka. And you want scotch. <laughs> so you're gonna lift it up and you're gonna shift it over and you're gonna put it down until, until the guy, I, you sold me the wrong thing. So. You got to work with what you got. So you got to work with what you got and, and trading in that, that bottle of vodka for a bottle of scotch, you're definitely not an equal win to win there. But a lift and shift from what I've worked with in the past has been on-prem data centers, on-prem huge applications. I'm, I'm talking monstrously huge applications that cover the entire planet uh, one company I worked for did all this lighting for signs and, and trains all over the world. 
every light, uh, every light fixture you can imagine that came for trains came from this company. It's right here in Texas, and they wanted to do a lift to shift in cloud. Their problem was is they they were using a software that was built in 1983. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's called Sightline. And it uses a Postgres database that was Unix, not Linux only. And it was for a Spark server. And oh. it was a lift, lift and shift, yeah, exactly. A lift and shift solution. So oh. first we had to get code compile and we had to get process written out. And then we started ripping things off. And that wouldn't work. It, none of it would work. So we're like, okay, it's not cloud ready. We found a company that had a wrapper that would go around the entire application, lift it into the cloud, and shift all of the workload into the cloud. Couldn't believe it. So they took their entire old database, old everything, wrapped it around, moved it into the cloud, and they still have executables and DLLs and, and, and tar GZ files and SPC files, but they still work in the cloud in containers. That entire workload was lifted from their data center and shifted into the cloud into EKS. Interesting, painful, but interesting. Then finally we have the application like the previous one is so monstrous and, and so difficult to work with that I'm gonna peel little pieces of it apart and, and, and bring those little pieces slowly together. It's like breaking the mirror, but not letting it out of the frame and picking apart each little broken piece of the mirror, moving it into a new location, gluing it on a new piece of cardboard, and then eventually getting a new mirror in a new location. So we had a power builder application. That's, that's Oracle's original software language called Power Builder. And it was completely EXE. There are no, and the company did not use SVN at all. So there are no rollbacks on changes. If, if you made a change, that's what you got. And if you had a backup of it and they had no process for backup and their rollbacks were terrible and they were like we got to cloudify this we got to get this out of the center we got to change it and instead of taking the little bits and breaking the glass and putting it in the cloud we took it we broke the glass and then broke it down and figured out what that process was i pick up order from john john sends it to ups ups responds with this three api calls made it a microservice put it in Kubernetes and said, hey, we received 10 million calls per day on this API doing this response. And the Oracle database through Power Builder is tanking. We took that one part, moved into the cloud, moved into Kubernetes, moved to EKS. Problem resolved. Then they kept going through each and every piece of that application, ripping it down, moving it into Kubernetes, containerizing it, rewriting it in Java instead of this power builder language and kept doing it over and over and over again. There are <clears throat> many advantages to this. The biggest advantage is when you have an application that is that old or that monolithic, there's tribal knowledge and there's documentation and there's installation and all kinds of other artifacts that probably don't exist anymore. This application that I'm talking about had been around for over 27 years. 27 years, the same application written in Power Builder. And it's been upgraded here. And this little part was upgraded. UPS changed its user ID. That was upgraded. As we were going through and ripping pieces off and sticking in the cloud, we found so many things that were wrong. <clears throat> so apparently there was a time in which <clears throat> shipments from New Mexico weren't allowed in UPS after 7 p.m. So somebody went into the code and hard coded that no shipments are allowed to be sent out from UPS after 7 p.m. in New Mexico. So we could never figure out what the delay was in all the shipments in New Mexico until we started ripping apart this giant monolithic application. And in doing so, we documented it, we turned it into procedures, we wrote, wrote architecture documents over it. 
and the company went from paying a licensing fee in, in the order of $11 million a year down to $300,000. Huge change, huge change in the business, huge difference. But that was all done one piece at a time. Very difficult, very time consuming. Those are the reasons, those are the top four things that I focus on, top four questions I get. And people ask me a lot, is, is this easier? Is it better to go this way? Yes, it is. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, hold on, let me double check the tweet deck. Um, um, this, this one's a little tough to parse. I, th I think what they're, I think what they're trying to say is in the, in the lift and shift, in the, oh, actually, hold on, wait a second. Uh, somebody from local QA, Mithun, um, asked which container is used with EKS. Which container is used with EKS? That's that's an interesting question. It's not a specific container. So th that's the only answer I've got. <laughs> Are you asking what operating system is behind it? What, what, where, I, I, things yeah, like I, that? I think that's what they're getting at. What's, what's the, the backing operating system? Okay. So I'm not sure on that because every time I've leveraged it, it's been something I've had to open a ticket to ask a question about the master nodes and the worker nodes. Um, I've never actually spent time looking at that. So I would definitely look into that. I will ask questions about that. I don't know the answer to that question. If there is a specific answer to that question. Understood. Uh, and there was one more question about um, uh, the, the lift and shift up. Actually, uh, my, my question is, wait, did you at the beginning of this say that you were not a developer? Did you accuse yourself of being an operations guy? Because most of everything that you've talked about has been steeped in the lore of, of development. Right. Um, so I'm calling I'm calling shenanigans on your on your declaration, Mr. Dan. No problem. Um, I'm more of an architect. Um, I've done development for I don't know. I was doing Commodore 64 when I was 10 years old, <laughs> and uh, my my degree is in computer science programming. Um, I worked at Rackspace for four and a half years as a L three and then worked with an L4 mm. uh, .NET developer. So yeah, I, I'd have to say I've got developer experience in my background. Yeah, um, just a little. Just a little bit. But uh, yeah, uh, engineering, done a lot of engineering, writing stuff, building operations, rack and stack. Uh, that stuff's just so much fun to me, is building out data centers and stuff like that, uh, especially in the military. Mm -hmm. Oh, those guys are crazy fun. So yeah, building a rack and putting it inside of a Humvee is the best best thing in the world. I'm telling you what. And then the submarines I put them in. Oh my goodness, so much fun. Um, that so, that yeah, sounds yeah. like another story for. Well, actually, you probably can't talk about that stuff. That That's about like as much as I could talk about it. It's a fascinating story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some more of a DevOps. I mean, ever since I picked up the Phoenix project and I read it, and I was like, this is exactly my job. This is where we are. We are so backwards and it's so broken and so siloed and nobody wants to talk to each other. And I started putting together meetings when I was the automation engineering lead and I put together meetings with all the other database and, and operations and infrastructure teams and, and putting them all together and, and kumbaya and talking about things. And, and all of the developers are like, yeah, we've got this on our laptop. I said, what is that? And it's like, it's Kubernetes. Have you ever heard of it yet? So this is back when Kubernetes was 092 version and, and I was addicted. And uh, ever since then I've been doing Kubernetes and, and you have to have some coding knowledge. You have to be able to do um, YAML, Java. You just gotta understand some of that stuff. And, and I've been writing stuff since I was uh, <laughs> 10 years old. Since you were knee high to a grasshopper. Right, right. Choose your own adventure since I was 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, uh, that's it for questions. Uh, did you want to, did you want to do a, a demo or was, sure. was there? 
Is there a thing that you wanted to throw up? I could talk about this a little bit. So okay. the problem with um, building in the cloud, I'll tell you that right now, I'm being honest. The problem with, can you see my screen on the right hand side? Yep, we can see it. That's my right hand side. Is, um, see my daughter got me addicted to My Hero Academia, so that was in the background there. Is that your wallpaper? Nice. Yeah, it's a little anime that she had and she's just having fun. So yeah, um, the problem with the cloud is even though it's fast on responding to questions because it's an API call, that doesn't mean it's fast for building. Because what you're usually doing is you're building in a giant list of operations that are being built in the cloud and you have to wait for each operation to complete. Amazon's really diligent in making sure that the operation is not only complete, but it's clean and there's no errors and you're not getting problems. So the tool that I was uh, mentioning earlier is, that Amazon uses is um, EKS uh, CTL. Mm -hmm. And if you see here, what I did was I created a very simple EKS demo, demo YAML. And in this YAML, I'm defining my entire cluster environment right here. That's it. That's my entire cluster. I want three nodes, the end. Nothing more special about the nodes. I don't even care what kind of nodes. I don't care what the grouping is, nothing. Just three nodes. And uh, please make sure they're clustered together. And um, here's, here's the name I want you to put for my, my cluster. That's it. That's all that's here. There's a username and what region I want it to be in. And from there, I issue the command to go ahead and start it. So that's EKS CTL create. And from there, it starts building it using that YAML file. And it builds the entire cluster. And it took about 22 minutes. I don't want to bore everybody with sitting here watching things one, one line at a time. But after 22 minutes, I had this entire an entire cluster up and running. So now I have an EKS cluster. Yay! The next thing I, I wanted to do was maybe demo a, a workload, a very simple workload known as a Kubernetes dashboard. So Kubernetes dashboard is is awesome. It'll it'll take everything from the command line, all the queries you can type in, all the logs and everything, and it, it puts it in a GUI. It makes it easier for the operations teams who are L1 through L2 to say, hey, I can, I can check that workload for you. Oh, look, your CPU is pegging out. Let me see if I can increase your limits for your CPU. So I really enjoy the dashboard. Now, this here is, is me applying it from a remote location, and I built it, and then I deleted it so I could show it to you. But then I also grabbed the actual file so I could go ahead and build it for you. <coughs> Let me go ahead and do that here. Oh, and, and you got props from a, uh, an audience member for your uh, wallpaper, your My Hero Academia wallpaper. Right. Nothing like a 47-year-old man enjoying My Hero Academia. <laughs> yes, yes. Much joy. Um, so now I have the entire stack here. And, and it, it's got all the same commands. So you got kube cuddle. It nodes, right? And take a look. There we go. We got our three nodes that I had described earlier. And maybe we want, we want to do a get all and see what's running on this cluster. Nothing's running in the default namespace. So let's take a look and see what namespaces exist. So namespace. Oh, one of the namespaces we have that looks like dooby dooby doop. Yes, there is a new namespace called Kubernetes dashboard. So let's go ahead and talk to that one. And same thing with get all again. But we're going to do minus n for namespace, and we're going to pay. Well, it doesn't work like that because I'm lazy. No, oh, there we go. <coughs> and that's the entire structure <coughs> that we had asked to set up. I'm sorry, my voice is going a little hoarse now. It's probably the longest I've talked ever since the COVID thing. Oh, well, we'll, we'll be wrapping up shortly anyway, so don't want to stress out your lungs. That's fine. So now you have all of this stuff here, all of your nodes, all of your pods, your deployment, everything that came from the YAML file. Mm -hmm. And I can cat the dash, <coughs> and you see that a normal workload, not only is it defining the ports, the protocols, but you can also define the weight 
um, what is considered a healthy response and a non-healthy response. You can say anything you want about attaching to different types of storage from NFS, iSCSI to cloud storage, to other types of uh, Kubernetes or cloud-centric storage. So storage in the beginning of Kubernetes at 092 when I was started, storage was an issue because you only had a couple of choices there. Uh, but now store everybody's offering a storage solution. So storage is no longer an issue because there's literally only three planes of, of control in Kubernetes. There's the management plane, which AWS controls. There's the worker plane where you deploy your workloads. And then there's the data, the data storage plane where you connect to a place to store data or retrieve data. Uh, temporary data or create uh, new objects like an S3 bucket or whatnot. So those are the three planes of a uh, Kubernetes cluster that most people don't realize, you know, if you take a step back and look at it, you're like, oh, one third of it's controlled by Amazon. They manage that for me. Uh, the worker nodes will scale up and down based on what I tell the pod to do. So I control that. And the database, uh, the storage plane, uh, Amazon has micro has services like RDS and Aurora and, and and tons of different options there that they can manage for me as well. So literally, the only thing I have to manage is the application layer now, and that's another big point of EKS is that it can handle that for you. And that that's that was the end of the demo pretty much, unless you guys want to see the GUI interface and I can pull that up if, you, if you're interested. Um, well, I want to be um, cognizant of your of your throat. If if it's if it's short, then it's absolutely. But but I don't want to. If you're if you're wearing down, we we can wrap up. Uh, give me a second here. Let's see if I uh, expose my port. Okay, now it's exposed. Let's go ahead and attach to it. So I'm just looking at the running application, see that that's there. Give me a second. At the end of it, you got to put... <laughs> Tim Davis from the audience is, uh, is saying EKS is the devil. Um, but he's opinionated and uh, he, he's a good friend. So I, I get to call him a, a jerk uh, on the, during the recording. So shut up, Tim. No, please <laughs> tell me, tell me why you think it's the devil. Oh, no, no. He won't, he won't give a reason. He'll, he'll just, he'll just drop that in and then, oh. uh, and then, and then walk. So. <laughs> okay. I gotcha. I, I thought it would be something mm. more nefarious. No, no, it would it would be interesting to have a um, a conversation afterwards to f to figure out where he's going to go with that, but um, yeah, it's it won't happen uh, during during the during the session. Okay, so I got to generate a token so I can log in. Here is my token. Did I put the wrong one? Just type it in manually. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why it's not working there. Oh, that's that's fine. Yeah, okay. it's all good. The the, pro the proper demo gods were not uh, appeased. So <laughs> no, that's awesome, dude. Uh, thanks very much. Let me uh, let me scan the tweet deck and the audience real fast. Make sure that all questions have been answered. Uh, yeah, that's just chatter. Uh, no, uh, people are saying thanks and uh, very informative and appreciative, but no additional questions. Excellent. Awesome, cool. Well, uh, Dan, thanks very much for coming on tonight. Um, everybody that is listening to this in the future, this will be posted shortly up on the YouTube website and thank you all for attending. Thank you, everybody. And we've stopped. <laughs>